Economies maintain foreign reserves for different reasons, which included, amongst others, to efficiently manage exchange rate volatility and adjustment cost associated with variations in international payments. Now, according to latest data from the Central Bank of Nigeria, Nigeria's external reserves gained $3.98 billion in just three weeks, rising above the $40 billion benchmark. The reserves rose to $40.76 billion on the 20th of this month from $36.78 billion, which was recorded at the close of the month of September. The reserves, which had maintained a growth trajectory in recent weeks, rose by $2.76 billion in September from $34.02 billion at the end of the month of August, as exporter entered production base contribute substantially to foreign exchange supply, which in turn strengthens the local currency. And now joining me virtually to make more sense of this recent development, I have the Chief Executive Officer of Cowrie Asset Management Limited, Johnson Chuka. Good to have you on the show this afternoon. Thank you, David, for having me. And welcome back to Lagos. Now, let's start with our conversation. This is quite an impressive jump we've seen in our external reserves from about $36 billion to above $40 billion uh, threshold. Some analysts attribute this to the current oil price rally. What do you think are the fundamentals uh, holding up this impressive front? And do you see this patent being sustained? Well, we have to recognize the fact that um, uh, Nigeria raised about $4 billion from the European market in September. I think that uh, credit came into the account into our foreign reserve in October which could have account for the about $4 billion, uh, increase we saw in October. But granted that that increase was gladly influenced by Eurobond uh, uh, loan, but we also recognize the fact that we've seen a stable oil price in the past couple of months. The increase you saw in September was gladly driven by oil price, uh, a, cre a creation of the interior reserve from the oil price increase. So it then means that if, um, by the time the NPS will come up with the, the trade reports or international trade reports, we should see that our balance of trade has turned positive again because crude oil price, or what we call terms of trade, is not favorable on the side of Nigeria because crude oil price, which is a major export commodity, price uh, has remained, stayed above $70. Uh, so the accretion we are seeing in the reserve, we are largely driven by one increase in crude prices. But most importantly, the big jump we saw above $40 billion is coming from the $4 billion that we raised from the European market. Mm. We still have the months of October to wrap up, November and December. What's then your forecast for the rest of this quarter of the year? Because we've always had this upward, downward uh, pendulum swing. It's been uncertain. Do you think we'll likely see a, a trend of upward movement or it's still going to be the up and down trend? Well, I think um, bearing any major uh, economic shock, global economic shock, we should see oil price stay strong to the end of this year. Um, remember that uh, we are going to a winter period when heating uh, need will be quite strong. And at that point, though, uh, need for fuel will decline. But other sources of energy coming from fossil fuel, that is diesel and gas, we should actually see an increase. Uh, but beyond that, the greatest downside risk we have in the world today is the threatening mortgage banking crisis in China. That it's expected that it should it happen, should it implode, it could take down or slow down economic growth in China, and that could affect multiple institutions globally. So if that does not happen, then we should expect that crude oil prices to remain strong because the world economy is recovering. Several countries in the world are opening up fully. The U.S. from, from 8th of November will open up fully to foreign travelers. England has largely opened up further, uh, I think on around 11th of um, October, to foreign uh, travelers that are coming from vaccinated nations. So the global economy is opening up further. And uh, that would mean that demand for input materials will increase, productive activity in the industry factors will continue to grow, and demand for crude will also be in, in tandem with the growth in productive activities or productions. So I, I think in the in the next couple of months, to the end of this year, we should see expect oil prices to remain strong. I don't expect uh, OPEC members and non-OPEC members to ratchet up production to the point 
as to bring down prices uh, as of when the demand increase in demand. Mm. And we also have the COP26 agenda coming to bear. Uh, conversations are ongoing. We're yet to see uh, resolutions being reached. But climate change and cleaner energy is one of the biggest conversations we are having globally. Do you think we are really prepared for such shocks uh, away from the oil price rally we currently have right now in the short term? Well, I, I think when you talk of uh, uh, It's quite an interesting climate. transition, most say. Yes, and you have to recognize the fact that um, with the return of the democracy into the government of the U.S., we are seeing a lot more attention to that. Uh, we've seen U.S. come back to sign or uh, to subscribe back to all the protocols. So that with, what that means is that you're going to see a situation where um, crude oil production in some parts of the world, uh, particularly the U.S., will be shut in. Uh, they are not going to allow for crude production in several regions of the world. We are seeing a situation where uh, the Western countries are pushing for elimination uh, in the use or reduction in the use of uh, fossil fuel as energy sources uh, so as to preserve the climate. What that means is that in the short term, because you're not going to see increase in production, prices will remain strong. In the medium to long term, as energy, alternative energy sources keep improving and keep displacing uh fossil fuel driven energy sources then you're going to see a long-term decline in demand for crude oil and that will lead to a of, of of the price of crude in the long term mm. now uh, talking about stabilizing our markets now irrespective of efforts uh, by the CBN to stabilize the Naira, have ease in the FX market. There's still some level of scarcity we are having in the Nigeria market. We are largely an uh, import-dependent uh, nation. Ease of doing business still remains a major challenge. How do you see us uh, putting a better footing in terms of our local production base, our export base? Then we can have more earnings uh, in terms of Forex. I think the starting point is that we need to do the heavy lifting. The heavy lifting coming from up, building the supporting infrastructure that will make it possible for us to produce, produce efficiently and cost effectively. Um, as it stands today, we have one of the weakest uh, infrastructure support for the manufacturing sector. It's only when you have that level of efficiency in your impute uh, cost that you begin to produce a no, uh, qualities and, and costs that are competitive with what is produced elsewhere. Uh, if your production is not competitive in terms of quality and cost, you cannot export them. And it, but once we achieve that level of efficiency and cost effectiveness, then we should be able to see a lot more export of commodities, uh, finished goods, or uh, secondary goods to the country to other countries uh, beyond the export of raw materials and extractive industries like we're currently doing. So uh, at the starting point would be let's strengthen our infrastructure supply, transport infrastructure, power infrastructure other energy infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, and then improve on our logistics. The seaports, the airports have all become bottlenecks to efficient production in the con country. So when we address that, we should be able to produce more goods and we should be able to produce secondary goods that are exportable to other countries that we earn as foreign nations. Mm. And also having a, a, a much more robust buffer. Some are also saying that beyond the Naira for Dollar initiative of the Central Bank of Nigeria, do you still see us pulling more remittances, uh, diaspora remittances, and what sort of incentives do you think we need to also make such policies work? Well, the first thing is this um, you have to look at the earnings capacity of the Nigerians in diaspora. Last year, uh, uh, COVID 19 took so many people out of employment. And those who are getting um, social security uh, bills, uh, uh, handouts, we are not in position to be sending money home. But we've seen a substantial recovery in the, in the global economy. As it stands today, some of the incentives that will encourage uh, the, the diaspora Nigerians to remit money to the country are the way they get when they uh, remit those funds. Because you have a huge gap between the parallel market trade and the official rate. Uh, between 414 and 475 for the 172 uh 572 so you have more than 100 naira margin so those who are remitting money are not likely going to go through the channels that can be tracked by the central bank i think some of those remittances are coming in but they're not coming in, in forms or methods or channels that can easily be tracked but uh so if the central bank has to 
um, encourage those remittances to come to the channels that you can track, then we have to look at the exchange rate. Uh, but I don't think the central bank would be willing to touch the exchange rate today, given that it has a stronger muscle to defend the currency uh, with the level of improvement we are seeing in the reserve. Mm. And then how do we also develop strong revenue uh, generation strategies so that we don't necessarily have to dip our hands into our reserves? We see the likes of Infraco to support infrastructure development. But some also insist that any sort of major infrastructure development to sustain the economy is simply a mirage, at least, for what's going on with what we see on ground. Do you share in that sentiment? No, I don't think so. The key thing that we need to come involve policies that would attract uh, private capital into infrastructure development. The government, as it stands today, does not have the revenue profile to build the kind of supporting infrastructure we need at the time, at the rate or the speed at which we need them. So we need to bring, bring it to private capital. And private capital will not just uh, ensure that we have those assets. They will also bring in foreign funding into the country. If you look at the telecommunications uh, sector, uh, virtually all the funding that came in to build a, a, a backbone of the infrastructure in the telecommunications sector came from outside the country. And because we came up with a policy that allowed for transparent uh, auctioning of the um, telecommunications spectrum, so there are several other sectors of the economy that both such growth potentials and can attract foreign capital into the country beyond that building infrastructure. Today we have an efficient telecommunication infrastructure, largely funded from uh, foreign capital. We can replicate the same thing in trans load transport infrastructure, rail transport infrastructure, even the logistic infrastructure, like the seaports and the airports. Uh, so it's not impossible for us to build infrastructure. It's just that we have to review our approach or the method we have adopted to build it because we don't have the revenue profile at the federal government and state government level to build those infrastructure from budget allocations. Mm. And it would be a crime not to have your take on uh, the new product we have today, the e-Naira. We have seen we are seeing the official uh, unveiling of the e-Naira, the Central Bank of Nigeria's digital currency. What, how, to what extent do you see this redefining transactions in Nigeria? How do you see this also helping to stabilize the local currency uh, inclusion, financial penetration, much more business on the regional scale? I think we're going to see the greatest impact uh -huh. of the e-Naira on financial inclusion. Uh, one is going to give those who are look, uh, located in, in areas that cannot access uh, traditional banking facilities to enjoy some level of financial uh, services through the e-Naira platform. Uh, the basic thing is that you can uh, transfer money through the telephone to anybody, anybody's wallet, and the person can use those uh, funds to make purchases from their wallet. So, and so it didn't mean, that means that you don't need to have physical presence in some of the rural and uh, locations that are currently not enjoying financial services. So where you have almost the entire communities completely excluded from the financial system. Uh, I, I think we're going to see this um, adoption of the in era to uh, have a very pervasive effect on financial inclusion in the country or need to have substantial improvement in the level of financial inclusion we have in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the value of the currency, remember that in era is marked to uh, the uh, fiscal currency. So the the values are going to move in tandem. So whatever happens to your um, paper money and uh, your reserve will have the same direct and equal effect on your in era. Uh, so I don't think that will have any, uh, there the, the, the will be any material impact on that. Well, let's also have your last thoughts now, looking at uh, the fact that we've had some calls for transparency and regulatory framework. We have that kickback from government looking at cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and others uh, globally looking at Ethereum and others as well. To what extent now, this is a learning curve for Nigeria. What sort of framework do you expect us to have? Yes, government says this has taken a whole lot of research, but still remains a frontier. What mistakes do you think we need to learn from, from the global community that have already been trading in digital assets way before we are taking up this leap of faith? Well, I think the major thing which I think the Central Bank has taken measures to, um, to get against are the issues of using the currency uh, to uh, carry out illegitimate transactions um, because the 
he never won it will be uh it's not going to be anonymous like we have in other cryptocurrencies that are anonymous so you're going to see situations where you're not going to see situations where uh people with nefarious interest will use it for uh criminal activities the greatest concern about uh digital currencies are that uh because it's difficult to track and trace some of these currencies they are kind of covered in anonymity so there have been instances where they've been used to commit uh, a financial crime so but i i don't think with what structures we are put in place and the central bank has also it's not going to be it's uh, it's not adopting a big bank approach uh which means it has defined limits for transactions and those limits may be expanded when it has studied uh, consumer behaviors and also be sure that all the uh, control mechanisms that we put in place are effective to mitigate mitigate against uh, fraudulent activities. Mm. Well, we all keep our fingers crossed to see how well the e Naira takes its foot in, in the Nigerian digital space. Thank you very much once again for your time on the show this afternoon. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Johnson Chukui is the Chief Executive Officer of Kauri Assets Management Limited. Do have a good afternoon. Thank you for having me.